Hi, I'm Mark Liebman. I'm a naval aviator, retired Navy captain, uh, an author and historian. And today I want to talk about an interesting topic, which is called finding the boat. And it comes from the challenges faced by naval aviators in every mission when they take off a ship is how do you get back? And I'm going to focus on what we did in World War II, but then also talk about how some of that technology wound up being used during the Cold War. And so in naval aviation, uh, aviators often talk about a boat. Yes, an aircraft carrier is a ship. And yes, boats, if you use a true definition, are carried on ships. But during the 20s and 30s, naval aviators started referring to the carriers um, as boats, and it's kind of stuck since then. And even if you're taken off as a helicopter pilot, as I did off destroyers and cruisers and frigates, we referred to our home plate, which was in fact a ship, as the boat. So with apologies to my surface warfare officer friends, I'm going to talk about finding the boat in this presentation. So here's the challenge. And this is a World War II example uh, simplified. Because remember, back in those days, we didn't have GPS. We didn't have satellite navigation. We didn't have radar on the airplanes. We didn't have homing signals until early in the war. And we didn't have inertial nav systems. And when you're at sea in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, 5,000 miles from land, which is really easy to do, there are no landmarks. And so navigating over the ocean is, a, is an interesting challenge. So typically what happens is you take off and you had a rough bearing and distance to the target. And I say rough. It's because intelligence, it could be a PBY or one of the scouts has reported the course and speed and the, uh, of the, the enemy task force, and it's given to you in a bearing and distance from the carrier. But that target is moving. Let's say it's moving, and I pick 20 knots. It could be moving slower. It could be moving faster. And in this case, I pick dead north, only because it's easy. So you're going to take off from the carrier. You're going to fly an hour and a half or so or whatever to this target, which is moving. You got to find the target. And then you turn around, and now you have to find your carrier, which is not in the same place it was before. And again, I used uh, an hour and 40 minutes uh, uh, each way, so that comes out to um, a little over three hours. So the carrier is going to move about 66 nautical miles from the launch point in some direction. And again, I picked northwest um, only because uh, it, was, it was easy to use. So this is the problem. So the question is, is how did you compensate for wind? How did you compensate for drift? How did you find the boat? So in the 1920s, this, as a, the airplanes began to fly farther and farther from their ships or their boats, um, this became, it became a problem that, uh, that they want to study and figure out how to do. Because once you get out of visual range um, and a short range airplane, finding the ship becomes a pretty interesting thing once you've flown 100 miles one way, 100 miles back, and you only have 250 miles worth of gas. So the Naval Research Facility or Laboratory in the 1920s began to create a homing system. And what happened is, in working with the civilian world, RCA was working on tubes that transmitted signals in the UHF and VHF frequency bands that were small, and they were powerful, and they could be adapted to a system that could be put on an airplane and on a ship. And they started testing the system. The first ones were installed in 1937 on the Saratoga and some of its air wing, and or in those days, air group. And in, on August 29th, 1938, after an exercise which um, was very successful, uh, Admiral King ordered that, that every Navy, naval aircraft operating off an aircraft carrier we would be equipped with this system we call, was known as YE-ZB homing system. And what you see on the right here are some of the tubes from those uh, original systems uh, that were put in, the air, put in the airplanes and on the ships. Across the Atlantic on the Eastern, uh, the English and the Royal Navy were playing around with their own system. They saw the same problem. And His Majesty's Sign uh, Signal School, uh, which is later, as I put here, the Admiralty Signal and Radar Establishment, was also developing a system. Uh, in the same rough signal, signal terrain, its range was, was only 50 nautical miles, or that was the targeted distance at 5,000 feet. As it turns out, their system was um, difficult to use. I would say clumsy or klutzy. Uh, its system accuracy was, was pretty good, five, plus or minus 5 degrees. But you had to fly level at 150 knots and keep adjusting the antenna to keep home on the ship. Well, that's, that's a challenge if you're flying a single-seat airplane with no autopilot. Um, and anyway, in 1940, uh, actually in uh, September 1940, 
There's a, the Tizard Commission, uh, which is uh, a British commission, came to the United States to, to share technology that they had developed. They were coming to share radar and a couple of other things. We opened up our kimono and we showed them YEZB and the Royal Navy was really impressed. And because at that time they were also starting to buy carrier-based aircraft from the U.S. under Lend-Lease, uh, Wildcats, Avengers, ultimately Hellcats and Corsairs, they all could come with YEZB installed, so the, the, the Royal Navy switched to the system, which was actually much better, easier to use and maintain uh, than the, uh, the British system. So what's YEZB? It was codenamed Hayrake, and you can see a picture of the prototype and the antenna. Somebody said it looks like a Hayrake. To me, it looks like just a cluster, it looks like an antenna, but that's what they called it. Anyway, so it, it, it rotated very slowly and operated in several frequencies. Initially, it's five but they eventually, they eventually got more uh, frequencies that they could use. But anyway, so it's someplace between 230 and 260 megacycles. That's the, UH, the bottom end of the UHF frequency band for those who are uh, tracking this. Um, they divided the circle into, uh, or the coverage area into 30 degree sectors. Each had its own ID. And then the, uh, and each sector had an uh, identification letter. And you could, it would send out that letter it, twice in every tenth rot rotation. So for those naval aviators of my generation, if you wondered why we had to learn Morse code to get out of flight school, this is one of the reasons. Um, anyway, the specified range of uh, the system was 270 nautical miles at 15,000 feet. So that's quite a distance. It was pretty much the, uh, the farthest that most U.S. Navy carrier-based airplanes could fly at that uh, time in, uh, in the war. So the YE transmitter, which is the ship-based part of this, was mounted at the highest point on the ship's mast. It was typically mounted above uh, the radar. Uh, it wasn't affected by the radar uh, antennas on the ship. And the reason for that is it wanted to maximize the range. And if you notice on this one, if you look at the aircraft homing system radar, it doesn't look at all like the original antenna. It looks like a giant bed spring, which is, was common of radar antennas of that, uh, that era. So here's how the system worked. It was pretty simple. It was effective, and more importantly, it was very, very reliable. So again, YE is a ship's transmitter. ZB is what's put on the airplane. It was a box that went behind the, the pilot seat. Um, you could select the frequencies. Uh, so every day, you were t every flight, you were told which frequency it was transmitting on, and you were given a list of codes uh, going around the circle from right to left. They were all numbered, and they were given a, a letter code. And so you would know if you were in a sector, and I'll show you how this works in a second, uh, by the letter code that you're receiving as to where you were in relationship to the, shi the, the ship. Now, they could trans uh, transmission frequencies can be changed daily. Originally it was three, it eventually got to five, and later on it probably got to more. Um, and again, as part of your pre-strike brief, you got a chart that looked like this with all the stuff on it, and you copied it down as part of your uh, pre-launch briefing. So when you're flying in this thing, so let's say you're out 200 miles from the ship, uh, you're flying along in your Wildcat uh, at 10,000 feet, and you don't have a clue where the ship is, other than the fact you knew you flew two, uh, uh, 270, so you know you had to fly generally uh, 090 to get back. Well, here's what happens. You, hit, pick, you pick up in your headset, you hear this signal, and you hear, did ah, did it, did ah, did it, and that's all you hear. That tells you that's L. So L, in this case, is a sector from 240 to 270. So you pick a heading between those two, generally halfway, and head towards that direction. As you get closer, the sectors narrow. And so if you go left or right and get out of the sector, you hear a different number, which tells you to adjust your heading. Um, and, that's as, and it worked, and it worked really well. Um, the tactical risk of using YEZB, the Navy found, was pretty acceptable for a couple reasons. One, we knew through intelligence decrypts that the Imperial Japanese Navy did not have direction finding equipment in the UHF frequency band. They had an HF and they had it in, in some other frequencies, but they didn't have uh, UHF. So the chances of them picking this up and being able to actually direction find on the source was, was pretty low. In fact, it was almost zero. On the other hand, the Germans could detect UHF. They were putting on U-boats, so the escort carriers in the Atlantic had to limit the use of YEZB, but for the most part, their patrols weren't as long, i.e. far away from the ship, as they were in the uh, Pacific. Um, the other exciting thing about this is 
uh, the UHF frequency is, uh, is not as susceptible to atmospheric conditions is as some of the lower frequency units. I have ADF, which is a nav navigation system, um, which is highly susceptible to atmospherics, or high frequency radio, in which you can literally see the airplane you want to talk to, but you can't talk to them on high frequency, but you can also talk to uh, a station that's a couple thousand miles away. It's just one of the idiosyncrasies of HF. So the other thing that Hayrake was done is it was installed at uh, most Naval and Marine Corps air stations along the coast, and the Air Force liked it and started installing it on their, at their, on their airfields. So towards the end of the war and after the war, what replaced YEZB? Well, TACAN, Tactical Air Navigation System, which is essentially a commercial uh, uh, Vortex a VOR station, which has radials, and TACAN, the, the UHF portion of it, actually gives you slant range to the station, so you get a bearing, and you get distance, albeit slant range, not, not level on the ground. Um, there are some land-based transmitters such as Loran and Omega. Uh, inertial navs began to, as computers began to um, proliferate, then we had radars on helicopters and aircraft, GPS and satellite navigation systems. They all proliferated, essentially pushed out uh, the need to have something like YEZB on board a carrier or a, a destroyer or a cruiser. But, what happens if the system is not working? It's damaged due to an attack on the ship or shut down to minimize risk of detection or the receiver in your airplane failed or was shot up. Hmm, how do you get back to the boat? Well, in World War II, uh, they had this thing called the plotting board, the Mark III plotting board. This is a picture of an actual Mark III from the uh, Naval Air and Space Museum. And essentially what it did is you've seen the guys in the World War II movies with these plotting boards on their laps. That's what it is, okay? And what they do is they, you can plot where the ship is, you plot out where the target is, and you, you load in the wind direction and the, the estimated wind direction and speed, and now you can begin to figure out drift. Um, and then when you get to the point in space where the ship, the targets were to get home, you do, we used to call it a, uh, a Ouija board, um, you actually spin the board around and you can actually get a heading to fly home. And he, while YEZB was wonderful, to get out of the training came in, you had to be very proficient with this. And also you, could do, you had to fly the airplane uh, and do this at the same time uh, the airplane doesn't have uh, an autopilot uh, or it's battle damage, which means you're holding the stick between your knees and relying on trim to keep your airplane wings level and at altitude. Um, so, it, it, and this thing would really slide out from underneath the, the instrument panel and it was supported so you could write on it, but you had your, um, you had your, this, your hand on the stick um, uh, beneath the board. So if you're left-handed, it was great because you just took your hand off the throttle uh, and you could write on it. But if you're right-handed like most of us are, that meant either you're holding the stick with your left hand or you're holding it between your knees. So um, this is how it works. So this is a typical strike mission. Uh, again, I, I did this to relatively simple, so it makes it easy, hopefully easier to understand. So again, we take off. We're going to fly dead east, 090, to, two, to a target 250 nautical miles from our carrier. Uh, the enemy task force is going north at 20 knots, and we have gotten a, a, uh, this estimate from either a PBY or one of our scouts or a submarine um, that has spotted it and radioed it. And that, by the way, that signal would go all the way to Hawaii or to another listening station, be decoded, okay? And then they figured, oh, you might want to send it out to our carrier task force, then it's recoded and resent. So the time late from a submarine sighting could be several hours, sometimes even a day. Um, but normally it was several hours um, before you uh, actually launch from the aircraft carrier. So you fly out to the, to make your attack, and now you gotta fly back, and again, the carrier is, is moving, so it's going to move somewhere around 70 miles, uh, 65, 70 miles uh, at, at 20 knots, and during the three and a half hours that you're gone, okay? And what the Ouija board did was give you the heading to intercept the ship. Again, you would climb up to 10,000 feet to give you um, a visual horizon, because the easiest thing to spot is the wake of the ship. An aircraft carrier moving at 20 knots leaves a wake that's visible five, six, 10 miles behind the ship. It's pretty noticeable, as particularly when you know what to look for. But again, once you find the wake, you find the ship, and now you, can, now you got a place to land without getting wet. Let's fast forward about 15 years into the 50s and 60s. And 
We now had the threat of the Soviet submarine fleet. Uh, we wanted to operate over the radar and visual horizon. The radar horizon for a surface ship is somewhere around 25 miles, depending on the height of the antenna. The visual horizon is a little less than that, about 12 miles, again, depending on how high the lookout is. And they didn't want to turn on stuff that was electronic because it's easy to detect. Radars, TAC and other navigational aids all are detectable by a sensitive receiver well beyond their useful range. Uh, some people use two and a half, so if a, um, so if a radar is good out to 100 miles, you can detect it at 250 miles. So that means you can detect and get a bearing on it. You can't get any data off of it, but it tells you where the, the source is. So in the days before GPS and onboard radars, what did air crews use? Well, I flew ASW missions uh, off aircraft carriers where we would fly out from the ship, uh, typically 100 to 150 nautical miles from the ship. We transit altitudes were 1,000 feet, so you couldn't see a whole lot or very far. Uh, we were well under the radar coverage, and TACAM reception was unreliable at those di distances. Our mission lengths ran from four to eight hours. Uh, eight hours if we, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and we often practiced without the battle group uh, emanating any electronic signals. And we didn't have radar or GPS or any internal nav systems. So what did we have on board? Well, we had this thing called the AY2, AYK-2 computer, uh, Navigation Computer Group. Uh, this is literally from the NATOPS manual of an SH-3D. I uh, put the date on it, it's 1975. Most of the controls for this thing uh, were on the left side of the uh, center console. Uh, it was Doppler-based. It was designed to enable us to track our movement and then find back, find back to our point of origin and allow it to be to be moving as well. I will merely say that it was difficult to maintain. Other people will have less complimentary um, terms for it, but I never trusted it. In fact, I used this thing, which is the Mark VI plotting board. It's the son of the Mark IIA. This is actually the one I, I, I had, and they were in every H3 that I flew. I, when I left the, my last H3 squadron, uh, the airplane was going to the boneyard, and I um, borrowed, my, borrowed this puppy just as a souvenir. And anyway, so it was used not only by, by helicopter pilots, but it was also used by pilots flying S2s, which had a radar, but they didn't have anything else. And again, uh, they could use the radar to find the ship if they got high enough. Um, the other thing is it enabled us to do was to go out to a search area, dip in an area, and then we would quite often be asked to go dip in a second area, 50 to 75, maybe 100 miles away. Sometimes we, got, uh, we often got gas from a nearby destroyer. And then again, so now we are out, we're gone four, six, eight hours. And so the question is, is how do you find the boat again? So here's a typical mission profile, kind of like uh, what I would flew, the outbound leg, we fly at 100 knots, roughly at 1,000 feet, 500,000 feet, pick, pick, a, pick an altitude. We're sent to a dipping station. We spend 15, 20, 30 minutes there, don't find anything. They got another hot tip on a, on a potential target. They victor us to that. Uh, again, it's 50 miles from where we were. We go dip there. We, we now are running out of gas, so we go to a destroyer, a nearby destroyer that's, that's directing the search. We take gas for him, we go dip some more, and now we gotta come back to the boat. I can't tell you the number of times I came back to the boat when I'm looking at the yellow light and it's been on for three or four minutes, and then the H3 it comes on when you have 20 minutes worth of gas left. So again, this is a two dipping area type of mission profile. Again, we take off. Um, and we fly out, search area one, go fly to another search area, keep track of it on our Ouija board, our AYK-2 uh, goes down someplace on the flight like it normally did, and so now we have to get back to the boat. Our assigned transit altitude is 500 feet or less, and that was done because we were given quarters, because we were in the quarter, we wouldn't get engaged by surface-to-air missiles. Uh, if we're out of the quarter, quarter and we suddenly became a bogey, uh, particularly since none of us were squawking IFF. Um, so there's a whole other problem if we were outside the corridor, both in altitude and, um, and some, some other reason. Anyway, so we'd fly back to the boat. Again, the Mark VI gave us the heading to get back to the boat, and we would more or less find it. Normally what we'd see, the first thing is we would see the wake, um, and then we'd follow the wake to the ship, or sometimes we'd see the ship. But I'll tell you, from 1,000 feet, your visibility on a clear day is maybe 15, 25 miles, 20 miles an hour. 
visibility to be able to recognize a surface ship because a carrier, even if it's 1,100 feet long, um, is not very big at, at uh, 10, 15 miles. So here's a thought to ponder about this. In today's connected world, we're all dependent on the internet and networks and Wi-Fi and uh, data networks that are encrypted. But what happens if they don't work? What happens if they're jammed or disabled or the satellites are shot down? Uh, who knows? How are you going to find the enemy? And more importantly, how are you going to return to base? So I keep telling all my all the young guys in the, in the Navy today who have GPS and SatNav and their, their SH-60s, um, they need to have be proficient with this, and they look at me as if I'm crazy, but I tell them point blank, it, you can't, it can't disrupt this by weather, you can't spoof it, you can't jam it, um, and it works, it's reliable, it has no moving parts other than the, the actual disks that move themselves. So if you like what you've just heard, so please subscribe to my um, YouTube channel. Uh, I don't ask for money, I just ask for subscribers. Write comments if you want. Also, there on my website, which you can see these from the hex seat, these are stories about from my Navy flying career about flying helicopters. Um, and then the fun and dumb things in flying machines are things that I did, my dad did, my son did, um, that will either make you smile, uh, make you think what the heck is were they thinking, or uh, scare the pants off you. So again, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.